Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Tuesday, everybody. Let's start today's episode with reopening, with national relaxation of many zero COVID policies over the last ten days or so. Cases across the country have been surging. However, now that testing is no longer as widespread, official numbers have almost no value for counting purposes. The number of high risk areas have dropped to about four thousand five hundred on Monday too, down almost ninety percent from more than thirty thousand on the seventh of December before Beijing shifted from zero COVID. COVID to easing and opening up. Anecdotally, people in many cities feel that there are cases everywhere, despite the modest official numbers. For example, Baoding, a city southwest of Beijing, the capital, with a population of more than two million, had no official new cases over the weekend. Yet, online posts from locals suggest a large-scale outbreak among residents. As we discussed in yesterday's video, hospitals and clinics are seeing surges in patients, with some hospitals already being described as overwhelmed. Beijing municipal officials said at a briefing on Monday that 22,000 patients visited fever clinics on Sunday, 16 times the daily average versus just a week ago. We can imagine how bad this will be once cases really continue to rise. It's been reported yesterday too that doctors and nurses at at least one Beijing hospital have been asked to keep reporting for duty even if they've caught COVID and their symptoms are mild. Official state media continues to heavily push the new narrative that Omicron is very mild and that people who catch it will be fine and should stay at home. Dr. Zhong Nanshan, the respected leading epidemiologist and face behind Beijing's COVID policies these last few years, has been giving interviews to calm. People down, telling a national audience yesterday that the death rate from Omicron is less than 0.1 percent, and that concern for so-called long COVID is exaggerated. Rural areas appear to be scrambling to prepare for COVID cases, especially as an early spring festival fast approaches. On Sunday, China's top COVID-19 epidemic control group released a working announcement, urging top hospitals to help those in the province's rural areas improve their ability to cope with the surge in COVID-19 cases. The measures include sending medical workers to rural hospitals and setting up remote networking to assist doctors in counties and villages. The state-run Global Times writes yesterday that rural areas should have one doctor and 2.5 to three nurses per intensive care unit (ICU) bed, and add 20 to 30 percent of total medical workers as backup resources. It also asked 90 percent of villages and township hospitals to establish fever clinics by the end of March 2023. Major wealthy cities, however, will likely see the biggest surges first. Zhang Wenhong, director of infectious diseases at a top hospital in Shanghai, said the megacity will likely see its infections peak in three to four weeks, and it will likely take three to six months for the city to get through the pandemic. Yesterday, authorities announced that the nationwide mobile tracking app that collects data on users' travel movements would be disabled by the end of the day. To some, the travel tracking app was a necessary evil to fight the pandemic and maintain zero COVID. To others, it was a symbol of one of the world's sternest technocentric containment and surveillance measures. The discontinuation of the app, which has now been implemented, was a deeply welcomed announcement. And for those few foreigners still inside China, I am cautiously, very cautiously, pleased to say that we are now hearing what appear to be credible rumors. That centralized quarantine for foreign visitors may be discarded as early as the end of this month, shifting to just three days at home of quarantine when arriving from overseas. We must stress that these currently are still only rumors, and a border opening of this degree by the end of this month does feel unlikely. But for those of us who have not seen our families, And our homelands for three long years, that certainly would be one hell of a Christmas present. Next up, reopening with its risks and challenges does present opportunities too, and one beneficiary of reopening, economically at least, is a bruised and battered Hong Kong, as well as key Asian tourist destinations. In a note to clients, Goldman Sachs economists write that Hong Kong could experience a 7.6% boost. To its gross domestic product 
as exports and tourism income climb. While Thailand's GDP may get a lift of 2.9%, Singapore a 1.2% boost, and Malaysia a 0.7% increase. According to the Sunday Note, the estimates are based on two assumptions, that China's reopening will expand the nation's domestic demand by 5 percentage points and push international travel back to 2019 levels. We should note that both of these are very generous assumptions. Quote, China's reopening is likely to have the most positive effect on international travel, followed by stronger goods imports. End quote. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this episode of China Update, don't forget to hit that like button. And for anyone who can go that extra mile and help me keep China Update sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. I really want the channel to be primarily subscriber supported, which is why I limit sponsored videos to one to two a month so that the primary source of income comes directly from subscribers. As always, thank you so much everybody for the ongoing support. Let's continue with today's video. On Sunday and Monday, the Chinese Vice Foreign Minister Xie Feng met in China with the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, as well as the National Security Council Senior Director for China and Taiwan. There are not many details out about the meeting, but so far it sounds like a key goal was to lay the groundwork for the U.S. Secretary of State's early 2023 visit. According to People's Republic of China Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin, the envoys discuss, quote, properly handling issues in bilateral relations, including the Taiwan question, and strengthening exchanges and cooperation at various levels. End quote. Just before the visit, Washington announced global Magnitsky Act sanctions on the party secretary of Tibet, as well as the head of the Public Security Bureau in Tibet, and others as well. Now, while we're on U.S.-China relations, the People's Republic of China is bringing a case to the WTO, World Trade Organization, against the United States for its recent semiconductor controls. The PRC Ministry of Commerce announcement expressed that the U.S. has, quote, been generalizing the concept of national security and abusing export control measures. End quote. A complaint which will likely receive little sympathy in countries from Australia to South Korea, which themselves have suffered Chinese economic sanctions in the name of PRC national security in recent years. The U.S. now has 60 days to enter into consultations. If that doesn't resolve the issue, Beijing can request the establishment of a WTO panel. It could take several years for the case to be concluded. And, even in the case of a Chinese win, the U.S. could appeal to the WTO's even slower-moving appellant body. Friday last week, the WTO ruled against the Trump-era steel and aluminium, or aluminum for our North American friends, tariffs against China, Norway, Sweden and Turkey. The WTO dispute panel ruled that the U.S. violated global trade rules in 2018 when it invoked national security concerns to justify tariffs on steel and aluminium products from around the world. On Monday, a USTR spokesperson expressed, quote, The United States strongly rejects the flawed interpretation and conclusions in the WTO panel regarding challenges to the United States' Section 232 measures on steel and aluminium brought by China and others, end quote. Adding, quote, the United States has held the clear and unequivocal position for over 70 years that issues of national security cannot be reviewed in WTO dispute settlement and the WTO has no authority to second-guess the ability of a WTO member to respond to a wide range of threats to its security, end quote. Meanwhile, again on this topic, Japan and the Netherlands have agreed in principle to join the United States in tightening controls over the export of advanced chip-making machinery to China, with official announcements expected in the coming weeks. Yesterday, we examined warnings from top Japanese technology executives that the restrictions will likely do little to curb PRC ambitions in AI and supercomputing technology. And last up for today's episode, we are getting Indian and Western media reports of another border incident between Indian and Chinese forces. The Indian military announced yesterday, Monday, that Indian and Chinese soldiers suffered, quote, minor injuries, end quote, after they were engaged in a face-off along the line of actual control, LAC, in Taiwan sector of Arunachal Pradesh on December 9th. 
One US outlet signing an unnamed Indian official reports that both sides have since disengaged from the area and that military commanders have met to discuss the matter. We currently do not have much more details on the incident. As one China analyst put it today though, while there are no deaths reported this time and both sides appear to have de-escalated quickly, this serves as yet another reminder of how tense the border situation is between these two giants. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much everybody for watching. Have a great day and I will see you all tomorrow.